From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. This is a strange one, guys. This is one that's been sitting in our great collection of episodes we wanted to do one day, but weren't sure how to, uh, how to address, right? And so now... Years later, we are finally doing an episode on something called Operation Prato or Operation Saucer or Operation Plate or Operation Dish. Uh, the translations are interesting. <laughs> it, it, it turns out, uh, you know, any longtime listener will know this. Millions of people were recently astonished to learn that the U.S. government has been studying UFOs or unidentified aerial phenomena, as they call it for much longer than it once publicly claimed. And all these revelations from this leaked footage, these statements of former and current government officials, all the details of these investigative programs have come to light partially. And it sounds like stuff that you would associate with an episode of uh, the latter half of the X-Files when they got super deep into conspiracies. But there's a problem with this narrative. Even as all this... Uh, information is being disclosed, and we are going to use the D word pretty often here today. Uh, the problem is this. A lot of the UFO stories that we see reported nowadays tend to be somewhat myopically restricted to Canada and the United States. You know, the Shag Harbor incident, uh, we, we covered that one earlier. Ro the Roswell crash, a.k.a. the wild weather balloon, uh, and, and so on. These are just stories that got caught in the zeitgeist. They're the ones that became popular. But it turns out that other world governments have been investigating UFOs for decades. And millions of people around the world throughout the span of civilization have also seen strange things in the sky. So today, we're going to look south from where we are in Atlanta. It, it sounded good. Anyway, we're going to go to Brazil. Here are the facts. So uh, I'm not a native Brazilian speaker. I think I can speak for all of us in saying that. I'm do my very best. I think it's Paria because it's got the accent mark over there. Brazil is a northern state in the country on the border of Guiana and Suriname. Um, and a, a river runs through it like the Brad Pitt movie. And that river is the Amazon. Um, it's a diverse, populous place that is the second largest state in the entire country. Um, and over 8.6 million people call Paria home. Um, and there is a lot of abject poverty um, in uh, Paria. And uh, so if you think of the Google map in your head and you're zooming into this part of the world, in the northeastern region of Paria, there's a small, teeny, tiny little island that you might never have even noticed um, if you hadn't, you know, zoomed in on the Google map in your head. And that little island is called Colaris. Um, and it doesn't really tend to move the needle much in terms of Western news in the grand scheme of things. But on one shining day in 1977, all of that changed. That's right. Throughout 1977 and the next year, 1978, multiple people not only said that they had seen some kind of UFOs in the sky, but they also reported that they had been attacked by these things, by these UFOs. And this is this is something that has become known as the Colaris UFO flap. Yeah, let's this is this is unique or we should say distinct in that there are multiple people reporting not just seeing something or feeling something, but they're reporting being physically attacked. And what what's fascinating about that is an attack means that there is some sort of physical evidence of something, not necessarily a UFO. Right. It, it could be that these people are somehow hucksters. Right. And they're purposefully like making wounds to have a crazy story in the headlines. Well, but also it may remind you of the Battle of Los Angeles that we've covered on this show where mm -hmm. allegedly. Well, actually, it was 
the humans attacking the UFOs in that instance. Well, yeah, that definitely happened, right? They were shooting, <laughs> shooting at the sky. It's that's. I think that would still happen in, in Atlanta if a UFO hovered in the air today. We, we would just people would shoot at it. But these these folks in Colares and in other like more than thirty villages. Uh, throughout the area, they all consistently reported the same kinds of injuries and the same experience of receiving those. They would say they were outside or maybe they were in their house. Keep in mind, a lot of these houses aren't built of stone or anything. We're talking about things that may be built out of bamboo or other native materials. And then they would feel an intense beam of light and they would see this light, even if they were in their house. And then these beams of energy or radiation or whatever you want to call it would leave burn marks on their bodies. And somehow this is, this is a key to where the episode gets really weird. Somehow uh, this stuff would also allegedly leave puncture wounds. In fact, multiple people who reported this stuff said that these UFOs were, and this is a quote, sucking their blood. Unexpected from a UFO, at least uh, uncharacteristic from a lot of other reports. It's a cool twist, though, on the traditional UFO uh, experience. And I like the idea of, 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 I don't know, I don't like the idea, but, you know, when you think of a UFO abduction, it's more like a kind of a covert kidnapping. This feels much more like outright warfare, you know? And uh, can how do you suck blood remotely? That's interesting. It's, it's a question that's haunted me for a long time, you know? Think about a tractor beam that you've seen in sci-fi films and stuff, right? But instead of just pulling an entire physical object, it's somehow siphoning blood out of a, an object. I like that, Matt. And I have to say, Blood Tractor is definitely going to be the name of my next uh, musical project. Sounds like it could be a slasher film about a farmer. Also uh, true. Also uh, true. Also, just to, you know, like to finish the thought, I, I just want to talk to everybody who's in the audience. Uh, like, I know it's a common question we all ask ourselves at some point. You know, how do I remotely suck blood? So this this might be uh, interesting to a lot of us in the audience because uh, we, uh, you know, it may be helpful to your research. No further comments, right? No, so. none, none <laughs> required. And all of this, all of these reports uh, that were sort of swirling around with very specific details led to a, a real kind of panic in the streets and a lot of confusion among the, the local population. Um, and at the time, it was a, a big deal. And it sort of, you know, fell by the wayside of history uh, and became much more of sort of a niche um, curiosity that, you know, folks like us would would be interested in or little clicks of ufo investigators i guess and the pattern was common to any observer of other ufo incidents right yeah that's that's correct it, you would see local news stories running right sometimes in a uh, a headline grabby way maybe you could call the slow news day piece the the kind of stuff that we would call florida man reporting here in the us and if you're not familiar with that, I, if you are somehow not familiar with that, please check it out. Story for a different day. Witnesses were often dismissed as unreliable on their own um, because, you know, a lot of these people would be from a lower side of the socioeconomic spectrum. Uh, more skeptical locals, when they learned of the story, would treat it more like a Florida man story in the news rather than a report of something dangerous. But this became an urban legend simply because so many people claimed to have been affected, hundreds and hundreds of people. And eventually, after a little bit of international attention, the story gets relatively buried. It's not being reported in the news. Other things are happening. The only folks who really care are these niche ufologists or maybe the people who believe they were affected by the incident. But it turns out, and we only learned this decades later, there was someone paying very, very close attention to all of these results. It was the government of Brazil. What are we talking about? We'll tell you after a word from our sponsor. Here's where it gets crazy. So it turns out that the Brazilian government 
And some members of the media, unlike many skeptical citizens, took these reports quite seriously. In fact, the Brazilian Air Force launched a secret investigation to evaluate not even not even all of the reports, just hundreds of the ones that they considered more credible or more compelling. And this happened because the mayors of several villages complained, like, my town is coming under attack uh, by UFOs. So logically, who do we call? The Ghostbusters weren't a thing back then, so they went with the Brazilian Air Force. We don't know whether the Air Force would have investigated the sightings if the mayors had not pleaded for this help. Uh, And we still don't know exactly how all of this went down because not only are parts of it still classified, but uh, many of the key players who could have told us about this firsthand have since passed away since this was back in the late 70s. So the intelligence agencies leave an Air Force base in Belém and they interview witnesses from Colares and around uh, 30 other villages in what becomes known as Apresal Prato or uh, Operation Saucer. Yeah, I, I have a feeling w- who was really sent were the men in black with a small Air Force attache or, you know, <laughs> a, a group connected to them. I'm pretty sure it was the men in black. We okay. must learn how to suck blood remotely. Well, yeah, <laughs> or at least figure out which species is doing it. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, the, the thing about this, again, as Noel said, we're not native uh, Portuguese speakers. The direct translation of this, you'll see it called Operation Saucer, but it, it may be something more like Operation Dish or Operation Plate, both of which sound way, <laughs> way uh, less like newsworthy. Operation Dish sounds like a e Hollywood mm-hmm. type. TV show. Uh, and guys, apologies. I think I said native Brazilian earlier. Uh, what? Mia culpa on my part. That's not a thing. It is, in fact, Portuguese. But yeah. Yeah. The So you can find some extensive uh, reporting on this from MUFON uh, and from other ufologist organizations. One person who's been instrumental in this is a guy named A.J. Gavard. He is the editor of Brazilian UFO magazine. And his take on it, you know, admittedly has some bias to it, but his take on it is pretty interesting because, as we'll see, he's instrumental in what we know about Operation Saucer today. According to him, the weird thing about this investigation got so weird so quickly. It was very men in black, as you said, Matt, very uh, Mulder and Scully, because the agents themselves started seeing UFOs at multiple points in their investigation. In fact, they were able to start predicting when some of these things would appear, if you believe the agents. Yeah. And it isn't as though they just stood by and watched it happen or something and then had a story to tell. They were actively taking photographs. They were collecting photographs. They were taking film of stuff that is out there, what they were seeing. It was supposedly hundreds, like a lot, right? Hundreds of hours. I mean, I don't know how many hours it was, but it was a lot. Like if you if you imagine just what it took in 1977, 78 to produce those kinds of images, you're talking about physical film that you're shooting and rolling on and they were doing that and they thought it was worth it. And that was expensive too. And one of the coolest things to me and something we've talked about on this show before is that uh, these films were allegedly showing these UFOs not going out into space somewhere after, you know, swinging down by earth for a bit. They were going into the water. How cool Mm. is that? So many cool twists. Oh my gosh. Yeah, no, it's exactly so many interesting twists on the, the traditional UFO mythos in this story. I love it. Mm-hmm. We have uh, so we have a couple of things that are already different from the typical uh, UFO story or investigation story you'll hear in the folklore, right? Or the literature, I guess we could call it as well. The irritating thing for this team is that they were a skeleton crew. They weren't complaining about seeing UFOs. Uh, They were complaining that they only had some cameras, some tape recorders, uh, maybe some radiation detection equipment. They didn't have all the 
the gear that they really needed, and they didn't have the manpower. This was this core team was pretty small. There was one guy who was in he- who was in charge of it. His name was Captain Holanda, and there were six sergeants, and there were a couple of other folks helping out. This official investigation only lasted about four months. Again, this official investigation only lasted about four months before it was shut down. And so for people who believe that the Brazilian government or the Air Force was just kind of doing a reassuring move for for very concerned mayors, then it sounds like, of course, it should only last four months. It's kind of like your parents going to check under the bed if you're a kid and you're scared of monsters. However, something else happens. I mean, first, let's talk about what they what they did, what the group uh, working Operation Saucer or Operation Dish, uh, soon to be available on Bravo. Uh, w- let's talk about what they did at the end of their investigation. So uh, Captain Holanda and his second in command, the Sergeant uh, Flavio Costa, uh, compiled this report that consisted of around 500 pages of documents plus couple hundred photos and films shot of the UFOs uh, purportedly and numerous maps and sketches. And many of the sketches show the trajectory of, of these UFOs passing over an area, uh, a particular area on the same night. And a particularly interesting aspect of the reports are uh, that a few of the objects seen in the materials um, did have a predictable kind of schedule that appeared in certain areas after 7 p.m. Um, at dusk for several days. Uh, the residents of Kolaris um, actually organized these defensive kind of uh, processions, I guess, where they would light fires in the streets and launch um, projectiles, like, you know, fireworks, um, anything they could get their hands on to try and scare away uh, what they referred to in the report as the bug. Yeah, the bug. You know, it's a translation, obviously, but it's interesting to think about it that way. It's very biological, calling something a bug or an insect or something like that, even when translated. But you know, which kind of makes you wonder what exactly are we talking about? What kind of shape? What kind of what does it look like? What what are the lights like? Is it biological? Is it more metallic like a saucer? I mean, they named it Operation Dis, Disc or Dish Saucer, whatever. Um, so let's talk about that because it wasn't always the same thing that was cited, right? Yeah, that's another interesting twist for ufologists in the crowd because typically in uh, previous incidents with multiple observers, what what we usually see is going to be a single appearance like Shack Harper, for example, uh, or a, a, a single series of appearances in a very limited span of time, such as the Battle of Los Angeles. Typically in those cases, we'll see wit- witnesses describing roughly the same thing. They might object to or they might differ on their ideas of how large the object actually was. Uh, They might describe uh, rounded windows or or something like that. And then someone says there are nine and someone says there were 11, right? All, All the typical things that you see eyewitnesses do when they try to remember something that hasn't been written down or photographed or recorded. But this is not the case in Operation uh, in Operation Saucer. We see multiple reports of very different objects or very different descriptions of alleged objects, to be completely fair. Uh, they, one was described as a luminous body about one and a half meters long, red, yellow, in color, moving at a very low height, just five to ten meters, and uh, it was uh, circular in shape, but it also had a, there's a quote here, multicolored tail that made no noise and it emitted a soft bluish light, which to me sounds comforting and somehow reminiscent of undersea creatures. Yeah, but it's a, it's so, that description, gosh, it's so interesting. Red, yellow color with this blue emanating light with a tail that is multicolored. Trippy. I mean, it, I mean was it, it a sounds bird? Like bio, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it does sound like a bird, right? Um, some kind of tropical bird. 
that you'd find in a rainforest. But then also mix that with the idea that that perhaps this thing is entering the water and then emerging from the water. I don't know, because it makes me think about bioluminescence and some of the possibilities that could exist there. Uh, just the, I, I love I love this, but that's not the only weird thing, right? No, it's not. Um, there was also something that was described as an inverted plate uh, with a sharp red apex at the bottom. And it also says that it accelerated to a great speed and produced a hissing noise at the time. So that sounds like a saucer. And that's a way less chill sighting, too. Yeah. Right? It's making a noise. It's uh, it's accelerating aggressively. It's, it's not putting out that soft blue light. <laughs> a hey. sharp red apex. So is that like a like a design feature? Like we're talking about like literally like a like a kind of a pointy sort of like a like a spoiler or something. Like what exactly is a yeah uh, yeah like a steeple almost mm-hmm. you know. But wait, we're talking about a steeple that's inverted, right? Because it's a plate that would essentially Mm -hmm. go uh, be rounded at the top, very similar to other reports of flying saucers with this point, you know, slightly pointy thing at the bottom, almost like a top. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That, that's a good, that's a really good way of looking at it, Matt. Upside down pyramid, Mm -hmm. a lazy uh, stalactite. I I, I think I've mentioned this before, you guys. I was like driving when when I was in this band. I was on tour and going through Nebraska, and I saw a thing that 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 was it was an inverted pyramid. It was like a diamond kind of shaped thing in the distance. And at the time, I had like an old DV camcorder. I mean, I still have it, and I have a lot of my tapes. I want to go through and dig around, but um, it was just odd because it was just hovering in such a way that I couldn't explain what it was. And I'm not someone to get hung up on these kind of things, but I'll never forget that. And it really did have this kind of diamond type a kite situation, but obviously way too far away to really be a kite and like static on the horizon. Him. Really interesting. Um, and all of this stuff was reported to Air Force headquarters in Brasilia. And uh, then, you know, surprise, surprise, the report was buried. And thus the official investigation ended. They got a pretty comprehensive report. Uh, it was great work for such a small team of people. And, it, you know, it was a case of like pats on the back and uh, thanks so much. Good hustle. Everybody take the weekend off. <laughs> Oh, and also look into this thing. (laughs) Right, and look into this thing. Uh, And then they they woke up later at an Applebee's. Uh, (laughs) But the problem then, the story becomes uh, reminiscent of true detective, of the the trope of the haunted investigator, because what these investigators found, whatever it was that they saw or thought they saw, uh, stuck with them. And they continued working on these cases throughout the majority of the following year, 1978, due entirely to their own personal interest in the case. And for decades, the findings of this team remain classified. They remain secret, uh, despite the fact that, you know, every Brazilian who pays taxes is paying for these kinds of investigations. And this is where we see the legend really start to grow. And and again, keep in mind, this is happening around the time that the internet is coming into existence. So over the intervening years and decades, photocopies of Operation Prato, like little snippets, photographs, documents, random pages of things, started leaking to first civilian uh, civilian ufologists who are already in that community or on those forums or mailing lists, and then secondly to the media. And eventually, uh, some of the folks studying UFOs in Brazil were able to compile all of this stuff, and they found, and these are legit leaks. Uh, they're not somebody with a telex machine in a free afternoon. Uh, these These are total to be summaries of more than 300 sightings or encounters in that in that island of Calaris and other villages. And the weird thing is, at least half of the reports of the leaked reports, at least, are about sightings that Captain Holanda and his team had themselves. 
So this urban legend continues growing. The Brazilian government, for its part, remains silent. What happens next? How did we find out about all this stuff? We'll tell you after a word from our sponsor. And we're back. So let's get into a bit of the timeline here about some of the major, uh, I guess, revelations and leaks that have occurred throughout this case and over the years. Well, in 1997, Captain Holanda, who we talked about, was there, experienced stuff with the whole team, took all of these uh, you know, pieces of evidence, wrote this big report. Well, in 1997... He's been retired for quite a while, and he decides he doesn't have to be silent anymore. He can come out and talk about this thing. Talk like about Harry huh? Reid. It's like um, Harry Reid. It is like Harry Reid. Wow, I didn't realize Harry Reid was fully retired, at least from politics. I didn't realize makes, Harry Reid was fully alive. Um, so <laughs> you, you got one up well, on me. Well, it makes sense. Uh, it makes total sense, right? You're you're done with your service, whatever it is that you're doing you feel a little bit of a sense of safety. So he came out, he began talking and he, he partook in multiple interviews where he discussed that many people had actually been hurt. It wasn't just the sightings. It wasn't just the reports about what people had seen. Uh, people did get hurt and he was confirming this. And that, that always, I think felt like one of the most out there parts of this story is that, the these objects, whatever they were, if they were real, because um, you first have to believe that they're real. They were actually there and people saw them. The The hard thing to believe is that they somehow affected the humans on the ground and hurt to them. And he came out and said, yeah, that's one of the strangest parts again, because exactly to your point, Matt, it goes to the question of hard evidence of proof. Right. Where is the thing? Uh, is this just a a memory that you have had, or is this just a uh, a moral panic? You know, an, an outbreak of uh, fear expressed through these claimed sightings. We know that humans do that all the time. So for him to come out and say that, and have firsthand knowledge of the evidence, you have to ask yourself: Did he have a financial motive or something like that first? And it appears that he didn't. It appears that he just got to the, uh, the he, he just got to that point in age where you say, "I don't care. What, what are you gonna What are you gonna do? Lock me up for life? What's that? That's gonna be like four years for me, tops." And uh, and so we see other other people familiar with this uh, series of incidents who also come forward. There's a doctor named Walid Carvalho who was working in Corollas at the time, and she said, yes, I can confirm. I treated about 40 different people for burns during this time. Two of them died. I told the Air Force team about it, but I didn't really take it past them because I was afraid I would be ridiculed. You know what I mean? I'm a doctor. I can't, like, go on, I can't go into the paperwork and say, you know, this is UFO burn number 32, you know? It's, it, it, yeah, it, totally. Damages credibility. Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. And you feel like once you've, I can only imagine, you feel like once you've reported it to an authority like the Air Force, then they will look into it further and they will do something about it. That's at least the thinking. Uh, and they did. They looked into it at least. Uh, Holanda did and his team. Yeah, we just don't, we still don't really know how deeply they looked into it or who else was involved. What we do know today is largely due to, I'll say it, the efforts of these ufologists in Brazil who are not a huge, huge community. After like a year-long lobbying campaign with uh, and the creation of a petition that got around 36,000 signatures, the government of Brazil cracked a deal with a handful of ufologists. And on May 20th, 2005, these ufologists sat down with government officials, which is a lot like, um, I guess one way to look at it, it's a lot like George Sukalus or something getting a meeting with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. You know, yeah, and, but, and but he's you know going aliens. <laughs> yeah, but what it really feels like to me 
is the work that Stephen Greer has done in the past, where he has met with intelligence officials on these subjects. Mm-hmm. And they, 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 I mean, at least according to him, uh, that he told to us directly, as well as he, him purporting to do in his documentaries, he meets with them regularly. That's a good point. And then also, you know, it's legislatively speaking, it's kind of difficult, isn't it, to tell a you you can tell somebody working in a government position what they can't talk about, right? Don't talk about your day job. You were on vacation in Panama, remember. Uh, but you uh, they it's difficult to control who someone can talk to. You know what I mean? Especially if you don't really, you might not know who they are or something like that. That all changes when you're in the world of like counterintelligence and terrorism. But if you're just telling some bureaucrat like, hey, you can't, uh, you can't talk to strangers who say hello to you. That's crazy and illegal. So anyway, I do quite enjoy your Steve Greer example there. I think it's apt uh, because also just because somebody's meeting with a government official does not necessarily mean they're meeting about what they want to meet about. It does it, you know, what is a meeting? I think we talked about that too, right? Like the uh, Tom DeLonge Academy of the Stars story has incidents where he meets someone at a hotel, right? Did you, were you, were you just in the same lobby or something like that? That's the question skeptics will have. But, but this, yeah, but this is bigger, right? This is much bigger. Yeah, this seems legit because in the crowd, uh, there were three top generals who were in the meeting. It was a small meeting. And they said, yes, look, UFOlogy guys, we're not saying everything you might believe is true. Uh, but yes, you are right. Uh, we at the Brazilian Air Force have been really, really concerned about UFOs. It freaks us out. Uh, we do systematically track them. Uh, we call them H-traffic. And then this is where I picture one of the generals, like, going, Bob wrote that one. And then Bob <laughs> going, thanks, thanks guys. And so H traffic, they've been tracking it since 1954, they say, in a systematic way, no one-offs. And then they say some other things, too. Yes. And the Air Force leaders had this to say. They said they recognized the importance of ufology, that they pledged to help get classified files open to the public, And they guaranteed that steps would be taken to form a joint committee of military and civilian UFO researchers to study the phenomenon. That's pretty cool. That's pretty amazing. uh, uh, What's the word? Transparent in a way we're not used to seeing in this country, for sure. Well, and what an idea. I've worked closely with the highly interested civilian counterparts that, you know, want to help. Like with a MUFON or, you know, with with any other organization that is doing their level best to find out as much as they can. I mean, yes, cooperate. Let's do this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, think about think think about all the uh, various politicians who say the public sector should partner more with the private. This is government in action, right? Uh, things things are great. Uh, it does remind me a little bit of uh, the it brings to mind the example of civilian satellite tracking, right? Which has been, it's a huge uh, subculture, I guess you could call it. Uh, there are people who just entirely for fun trace satellites in the sky, trace their paths. And they have been a thorn in the side of multiple governments because they keep finding <laughs> secret satellites that no one talked about. It's just tough to hide them because they're literally out in the open in orbit. So uh, maybe this is a lesson that if the Brazilian government was sincere here, maybe this is a lesson that Uncle Sam could learn about crowdsourcing, partnering with people who are already, as you said, Matt, highly motivated. Uh, But that's where the story starts to break down. So... Before we go on, I I do want to say in defense of the Brazilian government, they do have a a wildly different approach to investigation of this phenomenon that could, whether you're a skeptic or a true believer, uh, best be described as controversial, right, on multiple levels. Should we be spending money investigating this? Should we care about it? Should we tell people when we investigate this stuff? Uh, The Brazilian government has uh, been at various times surprisingly open about aspects of their 
uh, H traffic investigations. Uh, today, you will be able to see some 1,300 sheets of, uh, of material. And there's an estimated 25 kilos of material. Uh, this includes descriptions, sketches, photos of phenomena. And that's in weight, by the way. It's not like bags, bags of information. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah, sorry. It, it's so much that it weighs 25 kilos. It's not, not in bags. <laughs> they're not moving keys uh, <laughs> because they're staying in one place. But it, this, this stuff, this treasure trove of information doesn't just relate to Operation Saucer. It's three batches of Brazilian Air Force intel gathering investigations of this aerial phenomenon. Uh, the first two batches have reports dating back to the 50s and the 60s. Turns out what the general said is true. Uh, and then the third one, that's what came out in 2005. That covers Operation Prato. And these archives are pretty comprehensive. I mean, they they contain a lot of the stuff that we we've seen in disclosures from the UK or from the US. Newspaper clippings at the time, conversations between subject matter experts. It's not just some it's not just somebody walking out uh to their uh I, I don't know, what do people have in their backyards? Their grill, their Zen rock garden. Yeah. Yeah, that, those are those are good. Uh, a bird bath, maybe. But yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. It's not somebody walking out to refill their bird bath and then just seeing some random junk in the sky. These are pilots. These are people who are like air traffic controllers. They're supposed to know what most things in the sky look like, and in repeated instances in these archives, they simply do not. It, it feels similar to Blue Book, like Project Blue Book or Grudge or one of those, but you're right. It does seem to have a, more more resources, perhaps, or more input from more various sources. Data? Just more, like, stuff in the materials, it seems like, that's uh, accessible. Yeah, accessible is the big key there. I, I like the idea of combining these to uh, one thing and call it Project Blue Plate. No. Blue plate special, yeah. The blue I mean, plate special, yeah. No uh, meat and two veg. <laughs> yeah. So uh, sorry, I'm hungry. I sorry, am guys. too. <laughs> I am too. By the way, you know what my kids really into these days? Is dino dinosaur shaped chicken nuggets. Something about the shape makes them appealing to her. I don't know. I thought that that was like uh, I thought you grew out of that, but then I realized I like it too. Do they make saucer shaped nuggets? I, I'd be down with that. One I would hope. totally. Yeah, I, I would. I was thinking the same thing. Why is there not more conspiratorial branded food? I want like Bigfoot jerky. <laughs> yes. That's probably a thing. I want like wait, uh, wait, wait. Made of actual Bigfoots? Or no, just, no. Uh, okay. He's like the he's like the mascot. It's like well, no, he um, is the mascot for that one jerky company. Uh, oh, that's right. Jack okay. Links. Yeah. Okay, never mind. Never mind. Yeah. Uh, Chupacabra juice boxes. Love there that. We go. There you go. You're on to something now. There Illumin nachos. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I almost spit my coffee out. That was great, Matt. Uh, yeah. Cheese Masons. That's that's a whole branded line. Um, okay. But honestly, I don't know if I ever told you guys, I did a really uh, disturbing uh, research thing on just chicken nuggets. And I did never send it because I didn't want to ruin don't. it for people. I've done that too, and don't do it. Yeah, pink, pink slime and all the glorious mm -hmm. things. Yeah, just the normalized it. cancers uh, in the. Okay, anyway, yeah. So uh, I think our, our big takeaway there is we need some conspiratorial branded <laughs> food products. Oh my god. Okay, but I'll get a no, no. list. The, those dino nuggets are fine. We eat those too. We, you can actually look at the ingredient list. Yeah. Of, assuming it's the same ones. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's all just kind of like, you know, pooped out of one of those grinder things. When it come, when you see it uh, in that form, not so great. But then, you know, when it's smushed into dinosaur shape, much more palatable. Yeah. I, I, I mean, anybody who doesn't care for chicken nuggets or uh, nuggies, as they're called in various memes, uh, be aware that you you don't have a high horse to sit on because if you eat chicken in general, there's some stuff they don't want you to know. But uh, but Illuminachos, Cheese Masons, and so on aside, this story gets stranger. 
because to to you guys' point, yes, a lot was disclosed. And a lot of it is still, you know, tales old as time, very tantalizing, but not hard proof. The the Brazilian government hasn't come out and said, hey, also, here's one of the UFOs. Take a look around. You can ride in it. We'll sell you some we'll sell you some juice boxes at the concession stand. No. Instead, we find that the only reports that have been released to the public were the ones covered by the Air Force. You see, the Brazilian Army and the Brazilian Navy are suspected to have multiple long-running programs of their own, which have not been made public. And we, the public, are also waiting for stuff that was beyond the typical secret classification. There's stuff there. There's stuff somewhere in a dusty bin somewhere that is top secret, maybe matters of national defense, and so on. And here's where the story gets even stranger. It turns out that a lot of those reports that were uh, drawings and photos and stuff that were originally supplied to the Brazilian Air Force from that small investigative team came from a single guy. He was the second in command we mentioned earlier, Sergeant Flavio Costa. Costa passed away in 1993, but in a series of later interviews we found, his son would speak about growing up with, you know, this uh, military UFO hunter as a father. And this guy, Fernando Costa, had some really interesting things to say. It turns out that just like Captain Holanda and just like Harry Reid, Flavio got a little bit looser about his experiences when he retired. Yes, and one of these things that seemed to haunt him was a picture, a series of pictures of these three circles in the ground. They're three circles that appear to have been burned into the grass in one of these areas that they were investigating. And it's really really weird because it's three circles kind of in a triangular form, and they were tested for radioactivity, and they came back positive for being radioactive. And I mean, it feels as though that's pretty hard evidence of something landing there or something occurring in that spot where those three circles were. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Again, the, the claim that there is hard evidence, right? Similar to uh, the claims made by Bigelow Aerospace, which is still really weird, right? I'm not the only one who thinks those are really weird <laughs> claims. Okay. Uh, but again, this is this is a tale told from a father to a son, mm-hmm. right? Uh, specifically about the radioactivity of those circles. So you do have to keep that in mind. Mm-hmm. But it feels as though it was his personal belief. Yeah, that's true. Uh, also, you know, we have to consider that context beyond just the father and son relationship. It was occurring in an informal setting. It was probably like... I think there's a part in one of the interviews, at least, where Fernando says uh, my father would loosen up and tell me about his experiences, usually after Sunday lunch when he had had a few drinks. And uh, so it it could be – it doesn't mean it's invalid, but it does mean it's not the same thing as congressional testimony or something. But uh, to the note about subject matter experts – Costa was a graduate meteorologist from the School of Specialists of Brazilian Aeronautics. So he would have been very well aware of the usual mundane phenomena often mistaken for UFOs, right? Like he would know what a weather balloon looked like. He would know uh, what a sun dog was or something like that. He also, Costa the Elder, speculated on the possibility that Wait for it. The Colores UFO flap might, maybe, have something to do with the phenomena known as the Chupacabra. Oh, snap. Oh, boy. Yeah, because that was a big news story locally. You know, in the same way, that, I mean, I mean, larger than just in this particular area, the Chupacabra was super in the zeitgeist at the time, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, in the 1990s, there was a, a panic. Well, there were series. Uh, there was a series of panics about the chupacabra, goat the, sucker, the, isn't that the, the goat thing? sucker? Yeah, okay, mm-hmm. cool. And uh, this spread through Latin America. 
uh, in parts of the southwestern U.S. So this guy, Costa, he says, you know, I've looked at this is such a cinematic moment. He says, I've looked at all the evidence. I've, I've like collated all these reports and the maps. And, and from what I can tell, there appears to be a correlation with this UFO sighting phenomena and a fault, a geodesic fault that goes from the central plateau to Colares. And he said, you know, a lot, if I look at all the stuff we compiled, the hundreds and hundreds of reports, they seem to occur along this fault line, which is another thing you don't usually see associated with UFO stories of this magnitude. But as, as, as he said, the chupacabra was in the public zeitgeist. And this is something that uh, Fernando Costa himself notes when he talks about his father. Yeah. And just to reiterate, that fault line is where there are two plates, right, uh, of parts of the earth and mm-hmm. uh, that are that move along with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and, like, it's a fascinating concept here that perhaps that fault line has something to do with this phenomena and with chupacabra. Mm-hmm. And and yep, yep. and that would mean with the water, with the submerging back into the water to reach where the fault line is. Whoa. There we go. I mean, if, for anybody who wants to get really familiar with the with the fault, uh, when we're talking about tectonic plates, check out the San Andreas Fault here in the U.S., also known as uh, the leading cause of future beachfront real estate in Arizona. Yeah. But you're, it, you're it'll right. be a while, though. It'll be it'll be a long time. It'll be a while, hopefully. Uh, but I love your point, Matt. I hadn't considered that that they would be diving into the water. I say they. Um, we don't have any proof, of course, of some kind of pilot. Uh, we do know that the investigative teams believed there was some sort of intelligence guiding these things. But I. I, I did not consider the idea that they may be going in the water to get closer to the fault. Maybe to go into the hollow earth? No, oh, man. Oh, man. No, nope, no. Nope. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Fernando says, the chupacabra phenomenon took a great space in the local media, which generated some conflict between the military and the part of the press. There are some stories, he says, that then Captain Holanda invaded the office of a newspaper and confiscated pictures related with Operation Saucer. So that's strange because they're doing a chupacabra story and then someone from the military shows up, someone from military intelligence shows up and takes the pictures uh, from the reporters that's amazing. That makes the news story nowadays. That makes the news story ten times more visible. You know what I mean? Wait a second. I see what's happening here. Costa is the one who's talking about the chupacabra. This, he's the meteorologist, correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. Costa realizes what it actually is—that it's chupacabra, baby. And then Holanda, who was who was like doing the soft release of mm-hmm. of the information. Back in 97, who said, you know, yeah, it was a thing. It's, it was crazy. It was cool. Check it out. Um, but he doesn't want you to know the real story. Then Costa figures it out. He puts the pieces together. And then Holanda's like, no, 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 no. No, <laughs> no we can't. We can't let. We can't let the people of Brazil know about chupacabras from space. Uh, yes, print it. Uh, chupacabras from space. Yeah. It, it's strange because I was looking back at the timeline of the reports and and uh the num- the witnesses saying that they had the blood sucked out of them by these energy beams they they were they were saying this before Costa started making these claims so i i don't know it's still possible that uh, that the chupacabra was just on his mind subconsciously, and like like many people in the area at the time. But still, I like the idea of chupacabras from space. Maybe that's why there is no hard evidence of uh, uh, that specific cryptid existing. Maybe it's because they just go back into the uh, ho- hollow earth. I like I like <laughs> I like the idea of baby chupacabras, and I'm surprised that no one has taken that up as some sort of like 
child, you know, toy brand, you know, baby chupa, like, like sort of like uh, My Little Pony. Chupacabrito? Yeah, or, you know, like Care Bears, but like something more chupacabra based. I think the kids these days, they got real dark senses of humor. I think they would go for it. Mm. You can, uh, you, you can, of course, uh, you can, of course, get one in the mail if you be, if you sign up for our conspiratorial. Uh, oh, we got to think of the names. I'm so excited about the names we're going to come up with for our conspiratorial food brand. Watch out, Nestle. There's a new show in town. Uh, but first, we have to finish this episode. And unfortunately, this episode does not have a definitive conclusion at this time. As we record today, there are more Brazilian UFO cases that have yet to be released to the Brazilian public, and we currently do not know when or if that info will be released, and we don't know what kind of stuff it might contain. There are alleged leaks, aren't there always, arguing that something bigger is on the horizon, but the truth of the matter is you just don't know until you actually see it. Members of the government have gone on record against any kind of disclosure. Uh, one Brigadier Jose Carlos Pereira, who was a former commander of operations for the entire Brazilian Air Force, specifically said they would not be disclosing documents that harm people's privacy, induce panic to the population, or put the country's security at risk, even through translation. That sounds like... a a spot-on impression of things that other government officials in the U.S. and abroad have said. So, really quick, I have to I have to ask you all, what do you think is most likely, right? The skeptics in the crowd are going to say moral panic, public outbreak of hysteria, or maybe uh, repress or suppressed military technology, possibly from a foreign power. You know, like a lot of country, a lot of non-U.S. countries were uh, really freaked out by the first stealth bombers. Those were UFOs for sure. I think that's a pretty, you know, that's the stance that most people are going to have. But this particular thing is so much fun to imagine. We come across uh, topics like this, not infrequently, but... You know, every once in a while we get one that is just so much fun to think about the possibilities, the way the way Costa did. I, I, I frankly love this and I don't care if, if it's real or not. It's kind of like the Guidestones. I want to uh, I just want to sit there and imagine what it could be until somebody in the military comes forward and says definitively, this is what it is. Yeah. And then we have then we have to believe them. Hmm. Just kind of revel in the mystery of it all, you know? Ah, yes, please. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated. I mean, something something clearly happened, right? Something clearly happened, and even if we strip away uh, the the socioeconomic or the psychological uh, trappings of this and the framing and the perspective and the bias of the investigators and the bias of the ufologist and so on and on and on and on, something happened, right? And finding out that something happened here uh, led us to understand that the Brazilian government thinks other things happened, and they're still not really comfortable talking about it. We just don't know why. Uh, and now the Brazilian <gasps> government is very much in a "if you give a mouse a cookie" situation with these <laughs> ufologists. I love that. I love Do you know what started? In 1978, officially, Project Stargate. Oh, interesting. What if, what if these were psychic projections from, from Fort Meade in Maryland where, where they were projecting themselves out into the world and they didn't realize they were actually harming people? They were looking around Brazil. I'm just, I'm joking, but it is interesting that 1978 is when Stargate happened hang on i'm i oh i i was gonna say we should contact uh ingo swan uh but he has uh he has passed away ah uh but yeah maybe the the correlations here are amazing i want to do more cryptid stuff too uh, i don't i don't think we've ever done a chupacabra episode but we did do one on cattle mutilation and we found some 
some interesting things from both sides of the aisle there. Well, maybe. I don't know. It came up in our wonderful interview with Jake Hanrahan uh, that he's into cryptids. Uh, maybe we bring him back for a cryptids episode. He seemed like he'd be down. Just throwing it out there. Fully. Crickets. Fully. Or, I said <laughs> cryptids, not crickets, y'all. <laughs> so, hey. Let us know what you think about all of this stuff. You can reach us easily on social media where we are Conspiracy Stuff on Twitter and Facebook, Conspiracy Stuff Show on Instagram. That's right. Um, On Facebook in particular, we'd love for you to join the party at Here's Where It Gets Crazy, our home away from home on the internet, where you can uh, mingle with your fellow conspiracy realists. Easiest thing in the world to get in. All you got to do is name a name, any name. Uh, you know, and involved directly with the show or make Ben laugh or just let us know that you're a real human person and you are in. I even sometimes I'll let people in to just say, don't recall, <laughs> you know, just, it's fine. We welcome all. Um, but that's a fun way to interact with us. Um, you can also give us a telephone call, can't you? Yeah, that's right. If you are not quite, uh, if you're not quite on board with this whole uh, social media fad, uh, and you want to stick to the old ways, you can reach us directly. We're one eight three three S T D W Y T K. You have three minutes. They are yours to use as you will. All that we ask is that you tell us whether or not you are okay with us using your name and or voice on the show. Uh, Hey, just quick shout out to the person that I talked to on the phone the other day. Thank you for attempting to help us track down more info. Please write to us if you actually get it. You know who you are. All right. Cryptic. I love it. Yes. But how how do people write to us, Matt? Well, it is so, so simple. You get on an email machine, whatever one you have, and just type some letters and some numbers, whatever you got to do. And in the end... Uh, with that little box that says two, just put conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.